Hi everyone, let's go ahead and uh, get started here. Uh, thanks for joining today's webinar. My name is Dean Yao. I'm the Director of Marketing here at Genfence Software. Um, I'm joined today by Mike Poplowski, who's our systems engineer. He's going to be going through a, a really cool demo of uh, what I'm going to be explaining uh, a little later on in the, uh, the webinar. So uh, with that, let's get started. So today I'm going to focus in on a sort of new discussion that we're having around uh, Hadoop. And I'm going to talk about uh, the different uh, alternatives that you can use uh, in accessing data from Hadoop and also especially how you can go about uh, retrieving that data in Hadoop and being able to display that data in uh, reports, dashboards, different data visualizations and more importantly being able to embed uh, those visualizations into your own applications. All right. And uh, just a reminder to uh, you can ask any questions you want. There's a little uh, question section in the GoToWebinar console that uh, we'll be answering throughout the the uh, webinar here. All right, so you know what is visualizing big data? You know, obviously uh, uh, there's a lot of big data these days. I think over 90% of the data out there uh, has been created over the past couple of years, and more and more we're seeing sort of the uh, semi-structured and even unstructured types of uh, data. Uh, so big data, you know, the definition is uh, it depends on who you ask, but uh, generally speaking. Uh, big data is fast uh, data, uh, different varieties of data, and lots of data. So, and it can encompass uh, three main types of data. The first one is in structured data. This is your transactional data that you uh, are familiar with in relational databases. Uh, the second one is semi-structured data. And commonly speaking, this is uh, anything from emails to text to Twitter tweets, uh, maybe XML files. Anything that has metadata to it that provides some sort of uh, a structure level to it that you can uh, query and pull uh, results out of. And then we have our uh, totally unstructured data. So with unstructured data, the common types of uh, data here are video files, audio files, photo files. But even a lot of times, this unstructured data has some type of metadata in it uh, and, and could be classified as semi-structured data. When you have true unstructured data, uh, that is, is very difficult to query. I mean, there's no structure to it, so there's no way to issue any query statements against the unstructured uh, data, and uh, you can't visualize it. So um, the point being is that if you have real unstructured data, you have to add some type of structure to it in a, in a transform uh, process to give it some level of structure in order to be able to issue queries uh, on that data in order to visualize and then later embed into your own applications. All right, so you know why is everyone talking about uh, Hadoop? Why is Hadoop uh, so good for data analysis, uh, reporting, uh, and overall uh, business intelligence? Well, Hadoop consists of uh, multiple different uh, components. Uh, most predominantly, the Hadoop distributed file system, or HDFS, is a way to store data across a cluster of nodes, uh, storage nodes. And then we have uh, things like Yarn on top of that. That's a distributed resource scheduler. And then there's all sorts of other components in Hadoop. Uh, the Hadoop ecosystem is quite rich, and the package includes other things like HBase, which is a database that lets you uh, easily perform queries on that type of data. And of course, MapReduce, which is a distributed processing uh, type of algorithm that uh, takes processes, breaks them down to sub-processes, and spreads them across worker nodes. Uh, so that uh, it, it can be run in parallel, and result sets can be merged when they brought when, are, when they're brought back up to uh, to master nodes. So it's really great for large scale data processing, storage of data, and also data analysis, uh, which lends itself great for business intelligence. Uh, another great thing about Hadoop is you have a lot of choice. Um, it has a very rich ecosystem, and a lot of vendors are actually distributing their own versions of Hadoop uh, with their own support. For Hadoop, uh, Hortonworks, MapR, and Cloudera, in no particular order, are the uh, the top three Hadoop vendors uh, out there. Okay, so now that you have Hadoop, you have your data stored in Hadoop. Uh, it's all you know. It, it could store either structured or semi-structured uh, data. Uh, how do you actually get at that data? Well, there's a few different ways to to access and to query that data. Uh, there there's SQL ways and there's no SQL ways. Um, so lots of different interfaces to access Hadoop. Um, so if your applications are used to talking in SQL, uh, this is a very fast access to transactional data that's sitting in Hadoop. So there's uh, available technologies like uh, Spark, which is a, 
uh, a sort of a in-memory alternative to MapReduce uh, that's been getting a lot of uh, uh, attention and uh, uh, a lot of deployments lately, especially when Hadoop uh, 2.0 came out. Uh, that really enabled Spark to work directly on top of uh, HDFS to pull data directly from HDFS. So um, there's a lot of customers that are using Spark uh, side by side with uh, the disk space uh, um, uh, MapReduce method. Uh, and then we have uh, Apache Drill, which is really uh, supported by MapR, which is one of those uh, Hadoop uh, vendors. Uh, Drill is a, a new, it was released back in May, and it's a new way of, uh, it's, a, it's a query processing engine that's based on a schema-free model. Um, Drill is a good way to get that uh, Hadoop data through SQL, as well as non-Hadoop data sources you can actually access uh, uh, structured, uh, or sorry, semi-structured JSON documents, uh, Parquet files, and uh, even NoSQL databases directly. So uh, Drill can be thought of as a universal way of accessing uh, SQL statements across uh, Hadoop and non-Hadoop uh, environments. Um, and then we also have Apache Hive. It's another open source project that uh, has been around for a while. They're on version 1.2. And um, uh, it's a great way uh, to access uh, uh, SQL through a schema-based approach. And then also Impala is another alternative which is, uh, which is developed by Cloudera. So a lot of choice in being able to access uh, Hadoop and uh, issue SQL statements against via Hadoop data. Uh, on the NoSQL side, so if, you're, if your data is you know, non-structured, non-transactional, it's these sort of a semi-structured data that I, that I mentioned before, NoSQL is a really good way at uh, online, real-time interactive access. So there's a lot of NoSQL databases. Uh, we have uh, MongoDB and, and MarkLogic and Couchbase as some of the top document-based NoSQL uh, types. Uh, there's actually many different types uh, of NoSQL databases. We have document-based, there's column-based, uh, there's graph-based, and also key-value pair-based. Uh, document column are, are sort of the more popular ones. Um, and a few other of the uh, column-based uh, NoSQL databases are Cassandra. It's actually uh, open source technology. And uh, there's a company called Datastax that has uh, provided uh, support for Cassandra. And also HBase, Apache HBase, is actually part of Hadoop. And so um, uh, it's very well integrated and it works well with Hadoop because it's part of the package, the overall Hadoop package when you download it. And then HP with their acquisition of Vertica is another column type of database that uh, uh, provides NoSQL access to, to, um, to, to NoSQL data. Um, another point I want to make here is that NoSQL databases, uh, customers are actually using those side by side with Hadoop a lot of the times. You can think of Hadoop as the newer style of data warehouse or data marts. So it's great for accessing um, offline uh, data in, in batch format. And NoSQL databases are the new style of uh, relational databases. So it's great for uh, online, real-time interac interactive access of data. So lots of alternatives to, to get at to your semi-structured and structured data uh, through Hadoop and even NoSQL databases. Uh, so how does this all fit into BI, or, or data visualization? Um, at the bottom, you can see that uh, the sort of blue-colored uh, box encompasses YARN and also HDFS, which makes up the uh, uh, the bigger pieces of a, a, the, the Hadoop package. And on top of that, I've mentioned in orange uh, some of the uh, interfaces that let you uh, issue SQL or NoSQL queries to Hadoop uh, through things like Drill, Hive, and HBase. Um, and then the BI platform really sits on top of this. So it, the BI platform can issue SQL statements as well as NoSQL statements to Hadoop. Um, and the reports and dashboards and data analysis within the BI platform will query against Hadoop uh, through those different uh, interfaces. Uh, it's, it's more common to have uh, you know, your, your BI platform um, accessing Hadoop data through SQL. All right, so now that you have this uh, structure in place, let's talk about different ways to visualize data and different ways to embed those visualizations into your own applications because once you have populated the BI platform and given access to the BI platform, to Hadoop, then everything is actually, all the work is done in the BI platform to be able to create your ad hoc reports, your ad hoc dashboards, and uh, ad hoc analysis uh, procedures. All right, so in speaking with, uh, about J -Report, sorry, it's uh, froze up a little bit here. So some of the J -Report highlights are that uh, J -Report is an embeddable data visualization platform that works really well on Hadoop. 
We've actually built support for uh, Cloudera and also MapR through Apache Drill and Apache Hive, and also Hortonworks through Apache Hive. Uh, so pr providing very high performance and scalability in terms of uh, reporting and, and uh, uh, populating dashboards and reports with the Hadoop data. So we have things like uh, intelligent pushdown technology, which lets us lets the JRPort server push down specific types of queries to the database, whether they're relational databases, whether they're NoSQL databases like MongoDB or Hadoop data sources. And then the data source will actually calculate the results set and pass just the result set back to JRPort server uh, for storage and in-memory in cubes. So common types of queries that are pushed down are aggregation queries, where you're only looking for like the sum, min, max, uh, average, and count. Uh, those aggregates uh, are used in dashboards a lot of the times. And so the data source would push back only the result sets, which is very minimal compared to the entire, to the entire raw data and JRPort server uh, stores those aggregate values in the memory cubes for fast retrieval by the dashboards and reports. Um, and also JRPort sur uh, supports clustering where you can cluster out identical JRPort instances on either virtual nodes or physical nodes, uh, which is great for scalability and high performance and also eliminating uh, single points of failure. Now the second highlight is in self-serviceability. So JRPort has a set of tools that has a very low learning curve and it's really meant to empower business users or folks that really don't have the, uh, uh, you know, the, the development skills or the, uh, report the report design skills that other packages may need, uh, but they can create really quick ad hoc reports, ad hoc dashboards, and perform their ad hoc analysis. Um, so these are folks that are not dedicated data scientists or data anal uh, analysts, but they're, they want to you know, quickly whip up a report or dashboard and perform some analysis on the fly uh, very easily and quickly. And the last one here is in flexibility. So we give the power to mash up any kind of data source, whether they're different types of relational databases like MySQL, SQL Server, Oracle, IBM. Uh, we can mash up uh, Hadoop data sources and even cloud data sources with uh, Amazon Redshift and Azure uh, SQL Data Warehouse. Um, and also very important is the embeddability aspect. Uh, so over 90% of JRPort's customers are embedding their BI inside their own applications. So providing a lot of different embeddable options and customization uh, functionality is extremely important. All right, so, uh, so who are the typical folks that would embed uh, data visualization in reports? Um, so predominantly OEM types of customers and ISVs, uh, you know, companies that actually sell software that need a reporting element or capability in it. Uh, so JRPort embeds into uh, any OEM deployment type. Uh, these could be on-premise applications or software as a service or cloud applications. Um, and it's important to have a licensing model that fits with the customer's uh, soft, software as a service or on-prem licensing models. Um, so it's uh, important to play nicely with those. Um, so, so JRPort actually embeds into all of these different types of scenarios and uh, uh, this provides uh, access to reports and dashboards for internal users or external subscribers. Now the other type of customer that requires embedded reporting uh, are departments of large enterprises and also small and medium-sized businesses. These are actually folks that actually use uh, BI for their internal purposes. Um, so, so in departments of large enterprises, uh, JRPort could be the BI standard across these departments and a lot of times these are very large deployments that actually require uh, clustering services. And in these cases, they can run in both embedded and uh, sometimes in standalone fashion. Uh, JRPort out of the box is fully standalone capable. Um, and in SMBs, a lot of times uh, SMBs are actually using uh, some type of incumbent BI platform like Oracle BI Enterprise Edition or Microsoft SSRS or even some homegrown or open source solution. Uh, they find that either they've hit some kind of feature ceiling where they can't uh, scale anymore or they they have a system that's uh, like Oracle or Microsoft that may be overkill for their types of uh, deployments and requirements. So, you know, JRPort is actually displacing a lot of those uh, types of deployments in SMBs. And in here they're actually embedding or they're running in standalone. All right, so what does it mean to embed? So JRPort's an embeddable BI platform as I mentioned. Um, it provides all the security administrative features that enterprises expect and it provides a lot of the customization features that uh, you need to seamlessly blend reports and dashboards directly into your front-end UI as well as integrate them in the back-end servers to be able to 
integrate with your single sign-on, your security and administrative uh, uh, systems in the back end. Um, it has to have a sense, a very strong set of uh, metadata management where everything can be stored into catalogs. So all the dimensions, all the measures, all the formulas, the charts, tables, cross tabs, reports, all of this can be stored in catalogs for easy reuse later on. So you're not always uh, starting from scratch. So if you want to create a uh, quick report or dashboard, you can just look in the catalog and just drag and drop over the, uh, the components that you need to build uh, something very fast. Uh, so JIRAport also has a strong set of development tools, and this is headed up by JIRAport Designer, which is a very sophisticated design tool meant for report developers to build sophisticated components, reports, and dashboards, and also be able to reuse those uh, types of uh, uh, components. And also, uh, JIRAport has a strong set of APIs, and using APIs is really the deepest way to embed JIRAport into other applications, where those applications can call all of JIRAport's functionality directly through the Java APIs. All right, next uh, is ad hoc reporting, and this is a really easy way for business users to be able to create and modify their own reports. Uh, going through a very simple step-by-step -step wizard, starting from a blank canvas, and then cu cutting that canvas up into different areas, and just start throwing in different kind of charts, tables, cross tabs into those areas, and then setting, selecting one or more uh, data sources. Uh, a new feature of Jira Reports uh, distributed joins, where we, we can actually mash up data and join data from different tables across different data sources into the same chart or table component. Uh, so this is a very powerful and flexible feature. And then just applying a template or a skin to that report and uh, hitting run, and you'll have your report right away. Um, and this is a very easy way to, to be able to add sort, fil filter, uh, drill down uh, capabilities. All of your OLAP capabilities are supported in uh, reports. All right, and uh, another powerful tool that we've released about a year and a half ago is visual analysis. So Mike will definitely show you a demo of visual analysis in action, but it's a really quick and easy way to look at your data on the fly uh, without having to go through a wizard process. But if you want to um, look at data in an agile fashion, you can just start with a blank cross tab, drag over your dimensions and measures, you can spin the data, you can rotate it, you can change it from a bar to a line to a pie chart very easily. Uh, you can customize it however you want and, uh, and set your filters all, all very quickly without having to go through a step-by-step -step type of fashion. Um, so it really lets you look at different data views very quickly and it's all powered by in-memory cubes. Uh, as I mentioned, all the aggregate information can be, can be stored in pre-built in-memory cubes, which are very similar to OLAP cubes. It's our own proprietary uh, implementation of OLAP cubes. Uh, and that's what makes the analysis uh, extremely fast. All right, so more on cubes is that uh, cubes let you access and store data from any type of data source, whether it's Hadoop, MongoDB, uh, relational databases, even flat files like JSON files and XML files, um, other web services. And if, if you have a customized data source, um, there's an API set in JRPort called the User Define API that lets you customize access programmatically to your own data source. Uh, so we can store aggregate information in the cubes and also even cache detail data uh, into uh, disk on JRPort uh, server side. So reports and dashboards, the difference there is that reports allow you to show detailed row-by-row -row transactional data in tables, uh, whereas dashboards are really meant for summary uh, and aggregate uh, uh, displaying of uh, information. So two different purposes, uh, JRPort supports both of those. Uh, so more on dashboards. Uh, J Dashboard is a very easy to use tool that uh, lets you reuse components. You can reuse charts, Google Maps, uh, cross tabs, tables, and just drag and drop them over from an existing library of components and just move them around and uh, swap them out and you can build a dashboard very easily just by dragging and dropping. All right, we have a lot of different types of uh, charts. I'm not going to go through all these, but your simple bar bench line chart to much more complex charts like bullets, spark line, and even uh, radar charts. Uh, and we support a lot of the interactive uh, OLAP types of the capabilities, including other ones like linking to reports, drilling into charts, customizing parameters, and cascading parameters. Uh, conditional formatting is great that uh, if you can set a threshold for a specific value, once, once the value crosses that threshold, it can change the, the, the format of a cell, uh, as an example. And then even component syncing. So you, when you click on an area in a map, per se, that can trigger a filter command to other components so that they're all synced together. 
uh, all that have, all all that can be customized. Um, and so once you have all this great visualization, how do you get this into the hands of your end users? Uh, two different ways. Uh, one is through the web, of course, and uh, here's three examples of our customers in video, Visa, and Passkey. It's you know it's seem it's so seamlessly blended in that you can't tell where the report or dashboard starts and where the application, uh, the host application, uh, ends. Uh, so seamless embedding there. With with uh, with the web, you can actually set things like uh, scheduling reports. You can set them set them to go out on a daily, weekly uh, basis. Uh, so fine grain control and, and scheduling. Uh, we even support something cool called report bursting. And so if you if you want to burst out a report to multiple people, all you need to do, to do is uh, create one instance of that report, and then everyone can see their own view of that report based on, let's say, the username. So I would I would see a different uh, view of this report than, let's say, Mike. Um, so report that's called report bursting, and uh, we support HTML5 on the front end, and uh, you can output to things like PDF, uh, Excel, FTP servers, email servers. Um, with Excel, one uh, interesting note is that we're not just taking a snapshot of the image and pasting it into Excel. We're actually exporting them out into real Excel chart objects. So you can continue to do the analysis um, uh, directly in Excel. And then we have JRPort Mobile, which you can download for free from the Apple App Store. It's a native iOS app that you can uh, analyze your data on the go. So any kind of dashboard that you created with JDashboard can be viewed and interacted with uh, on a mobile device. So that's a very powerful on-the-go tool. So just want to talk about uh, one more slide before I turn things over to Mike. Uh, these are our latest highlights of JRPort 13.1, which was released uh, quite recently. Um, so we've improved geoanalysis. And geoanalysis lets users set up their hierarchical paths so that they can actually drill up and drill down along, let's say, region to country to state to county to city or back up. Uh, and it even lets you set customized markers and areas. You can change the color of uh, uh, the, the states depending on different criteria. You can drop markers and you can change the size, shape, color of those markers on particular uh, states or even cities. Um, visual analysis, it, we released about a year and a half ago, as I mentioned. Uh, that was a standalone tool. Now we've fully integrated it into JDashboard as a dashboard component. So this really calls attention to the fact that we are striving for product unity. All of our products, uh, features, components are all interactive and uh, 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 compatible with each other. We also have in, in, uh, enhanced, enhanced, SaaS uh, sorry, enhanced SaaS enablement with multi-tenancy support. So now we've, we uh, fully support multiple, multiple tenants in that each tenant administrator can fully manage their tenant resources, their tenant security policies, their tenant user policies, uh, and it's all siloed away from other tenants. All right. And the last few uh, uh, enhancements here are uh, distributed joins, as I mentioned. You can join tables across different data sources into the same chart or table or cross-tab component. And we're better able to handle filtering and rendering of charts and cross-tabs with very large data sets. So we're doing some uh, uh, clever performance optimizations uh, when handling large data sets. All right. So I'm going to turn things over to Mike. Uh, and Mike's actually going to show you some data in reports and dashboards, how to create ad hoc reports, ad hoc, ad hoc dashboards, and visual analysis uh, from a map or environment. So once you've populate, once he's populated uh, the data into JRPort from MapR, um, he can actually take these visualizations moving forward uh, showing that uh, data pre-populated into reports and dashboards. All right, so with that, so let's uh, turn our attention to Mike. All right, thank you very much, Dean. So for today's demo, I'm going to take you through an overview of the different features within JReport. But the first thing is, as Dean talked about earlier, how do you embed JReport within your current uh, web application? And we work with all technologies. Embedding JReport within a Java or a .NET, PHP environment, or any other web application framework is very seamless. Imagine this is your web application. Doesn't matter whether it's ASP files or JSP files. Simply modify your web pages by adding either an iframe, a div tag, or in the case of this sample web application, these are simply links to the report. So the user is going to run a report via URL. And there's just a few parameters that are required to generate any number of these links. So when the user does click on this link to generate a report, what's happening under the covers is this request for the report is sent to JReport server. 
And within this request, there is a query associated with this report. That query will be executed on your data source. And it could be a big data source. It could be a relational database uh, management system data source, such as SQL Server or Oracle. Once the result set is captured, it's sent back to JReport Server. And this report is ultimately rendered within the browser using only HTML5 and JavaScript. And you determine what level of interactivity you want on the reports, whether it's sorting or filtering. There's a toolbar associated with every type of report in which the user, they have the ability to print those pixel-perfect PDF reports, or if they want to, a what you see is what you get HTML report. Or if they so choose, they can easily export this report to a wide variety of different formats. The most common ones among our user base tend to be both PDF as well as Excel, in which the user can determine which format, whichever version they would like. And then by clicking the Submit button, JReport is dynamically going to generate this full featured worksheet. And there's some added features for those users who are comfortable using Excel to get their work done. And the first being that JReport preserves any type of formula that comes from the report. Nothing is hard-coded in this exported worksheet. A second feature being that any type of these objects, whether a pie chart or a bar chart, JReport treats these as objects. They're not GIFs and, and JPEGs. So the user has the ability to change the chart types if they so choose to do either a different subtype or a different type of chart because we want those end users to be as productive as possible to solve those business problems. Now, in terms of interactivity, we're looking at just predefined reports, interactive reports, the so-called canned reports, but there's a tremendous level of interactivity. When you use JReport Designer, this is our web development toolkit to create that metadata layer, the interactivity allows your users to click on a country, drill down from a country to a state, even down to the city level. How is all this possible? Well, when you create the so-called metadata layer, and specifically within that semantic layer, you're building hierarchies that allow the user to drill down, to drill up, to drill to, to drill to values. So depending on your data schema, you truly have unlimited flexibility in allowing your users to modify reports, to slice and dice even these pre-canned interactive reports. So I can go up in the hierarchy. I can go to specific data elements. This is how the metadata layer appears to your users. So they can really modify these reports. But it's not only restricted to the pie chart. In terms of this, this crosstab or pivot table, the user can click on one of these regions. It drills down to the next level in that hierarchy. Or if they want to, they can right click. They can go down in the hierarchy. They can go up in the hierarchy. They could change the dimensions of these column headings. It's currently displaying country. Well, let's change it to the territory. So you're seeing how much interactivity is available to your end users. And this is simply predefined reports. It's turning it actually to an ad hoc report. The more hierarchies you have of these categories of information, the more robust your reporting is going to be, in which you can allow your users, allow them to filter information. You can build these filter controls based on categories or regions. Just one more tool in your bucket to allow your users to slice and dice. And we can even go one step further. We can allow our users the ability to add additional data elements right onto these predefined reports simply by dragging and dropping, whether it's on the row level or the column level, any additional data element. And it doesn't require an extra trip to the server because all this metadata was present in the initial query. So we're just using JavaScript and dynamic HTML to re-render these reports on the client, not the server. So that's just the first of many features within JReport, the interactive reports. Let's turn to another feature in which your end user is going to create their own reports from scratch using this web-based wizard style approach we call ad hoc reporting. The user, it's a four-step process in which they could choose from these predefined templates. 
and your report development team, they could customize the look and the feel of any one of these templates just by modifying the cascading style sheets. The next step is determining how we want this report to appear, choosing different layouts. But you can certainly slice and dice the top, the bottom, to make it appear any way as your end user sees fit, choosing whichever components they would like to add on to this ad hoc report, clicking the next step. And now in this bind data step process in the wizard, that you can choose from one, you can choose from multiple data sources in which I can build this bar chart using data source A, I can build this table report using a completely different data source. So JReport is, is exceptionally flexible whether you want one or multiple data sources. And we insulate all your schema, your database tables, the, the, the join conditions, the queries. All that the user needs to know is how do I use these metadata elements to build either a bar chart or a table report? And in the department I work in, sales, my manager is always tasking me to build reports broken down by region, which represents the x-axis, and then choosing whichever aggregate or measure data element, in this case sales, simply by highlighting the data element and clicking the arrow. So self-service reporting is our bread and butter. We try to make this as easy as possible for the end user to build their own reports. And just by clicking buttons, I think we do a, a fairly good job of that. But let's now turn our attention to building that table report, the next step in the wizard. The whole user interface changes. We try to make this as seamless as possible for the user. Again, here's how the metadata is presented to the user. They simply scroll down this list. They can use the same data source, a different data source, and simply choose whichever data elements they would like to use in order to build this ad hoc table report. And once they're satisfied, they can change the labels. These are going to appear on the column headings. And that's it. That's all that's required to build a table report. But in each use case, some users may require groupings of that data. Other users may require aggregate information at the end of the report. Well, we provide this tab-based interface. So if the user does have the, the need to group information, simply scroll down the list, choose whichever data element, click the arrow. We support the use of multiple levels of grouping. And if that use case does require to provide those aggregate or measure data elements, well, all that is exposed. Here's how that aggregate or measure metadata appears to the user, in which they simply highlight whichever data element, click the arrow, and determine exactly where it's going to display on that report. So we've just seen from the end user perspective, without any under not underlying knowledge of the queries or the tables or the schemas. All they do is go click and now we have an ad hoc report generated from scratch with all that interactivity that is in your robust metadata layer, that, that hierarchy that allows the drilling down from a region to a country to a city level just by clicking. If they realize, oops, I made a big mistake, I wasn't supposed to display the region abbreviation, well, it's a very simple issue to resolve. Just right-click, exposing this context-sensitive menu, and let's change this column heading. The default right now is region abbreviation. Well, let's change it to the cost or any other data element. So not only is it allowing the interactivity for your user to change data, to slice and dice data, to manipulate it, but you can expose that metadata layer to the user in which they can add additional data elements simply by dragging and dropping right onto this ad hoc report, whether it's on the column level or the row level, wherever that orange line appears, they can go down, choose whichever data elements, and it doesn't require that extra trip to the server. We're just simply using the JavaScript and dynamic HTML to re-render the report. And that's not it. They can add their own images, their own labels, if they want to add their own filter control, just simply by dragging and dropping. Now in the sales department, my manager is always tasking me to build reports broken down by region or whichever data element uh, suffices. Click OK. And now we can regenerate these reports. Now Asia Pacific is not my territory, 
So I'll highlight all the other regions, and you'll notice both of these ad hoc reports regenerate on the fly. Again, with the toolbar, you can print the pixel perfect reports, you can export. Built within JReport, we have a roles-based security model in which permissions can be done on a component level, on a record level, or even a column level. So if you wanted to restrict sensitive columns of information, if you wanted to restrict records in your sales team so they can only look at their own data, well, all that is capable within JReport. If we turn now to a specialized type of ad hoc report, Dean was mentioning this feature called visual analysis, which relies on that aggregate type of information. So you can create a scheduled task which will query your data source. The result set is cached in memory cubes. I really like this user interface because it's drag and drop. You can build on the fly and as easy as it is to make a mistake, it's just as easy to correct things without any performance loss. In a sales department, I'm always tasked to build reports broken down by region. So we can just drag and drop that region, that re represents the category, the x-axis some type of time element. So typically it's either the month or the quarter I build all my reports for my manager. And then in the sales department, we're always tasked to build reports based on some aggregate or measured data element, in this case total sales, drag and drop. So if you're not satisfied with the look and the feel, maybe you accidentally have the rows and the headings backwards, well you can swap the headings you can have JReport dynamically build those color-coded legends. Just simply determine by scrolling down the list which data element do you want JReport to build that color-coded legend? Well, maybe category of products. Simply drag and drop that data element right onto the color palette and voila! JReport dynamically builds this color-coded legend. But if you're not satisfied, maybe with this style of report, it's just as easy to drag and drop and change this report to a different data element. It's unlimited possibilities within JReport. So you can add just different elements by dragging and creating that additional dimension of data. So we have it broken down by sales year. We have it broken down by sales month. And if you're happy with this report, you can, or if you want to continuously make changes to the report, just as easily to do that by dragging and dropping any data elements. So now it's starting to look like a report, getting a little crowded, well let's just remove a dimension of data. So you can tweak this report any way till you're satisfied this is how I want it to look. We'll save the report, I'll call this the July webinar, and we're going to reuse this report in the next feature of JReport called Dashboard. This is the last feature we're going to take a look at in today's demo. It relies on these predefined library components that your report development team will build. We provide the templates, whether it's the cross tabs and the summaries, or those visual type of reports, whether it's bar charts, lines, areas, organizations, scatters, any type of visualization, we provide the templates. For the end users, they love the interactivity because they can filter their own data, they can drag the slider controls, or if they want to, right on the component, drag to filter that information. We provide multiple components, even including the geoanalysis type, whether it's Google Maps, OpenStreetMaps, or even the templates to build those heat maps. So the user can really click, drill down to the next level, as Dean alluded to earlier, messaging works in between these components. So if the user drags this slider control to filter based on a range of dates, well messaging works between one if not multiple components by we pass parameters into those components. Another feature is, is what we call auto refresh. If you need up to the minute KPI related data, you can set that auto refresh feature to query your data source every 30 seconds, every minute, every five minutes. Every component has that feature or for some other components that don't rely on up to the minute data, well you can certainly cache that data within JReport server. We're very flexible, query on demand or caching some of your data. With just a sampling of what's available within JReport, 
another geoanalysis type component. If you're not satisfied with your single charts, the pies, the bars, the area charts, you have the ability to create combination charts, two-dimension charts, even three-dimension charts are available. And all that interactivity we've seen in predefined reports and ad hoc reports, well, that hierarchy exists drill down from a region to a country to a city level by clicking. Another hierarchy exists here. Well, we can right click and change the dimensions of this cross tab right in the dashboard feature of JReport. And in the last segment, this is the end user interface in order to create their own dashboard. And your report development team has built this robust repository of library components. Now it's your end user's turn. They simply navigate to wherever the components are stored, drag and drop. It can't get easier than that. They can resize the components, they can move the components, and it's not necessarily just library components. Everything that you've seen in terms of the predefined reports, it can be reused. We've taken a look at this predefined report consisting of a pie chart. All the interactivity is still there within this dashboard. Or that visual analysis report I created just a few minutes earlier, we can reuse that object within our dashboard simply by just navigating to the repository, dragging and dropping, resizing the component. You can delete, replace components, and even better yet, as the user, I want to manipulate this object as if I'm the person who created it. Well, that's another feature we offer because the user can certainly interact with this visual analysis report, the aggregate report. Well, if I want to, well, let's filter the data down here in the bottom left-hand corner by dragging any data element right onto this filters, and JReport dynamically creates the filter in which Asia-Pacific is not my region. Just simply deselect it. The report runs again. I want to display a different style of report, whether it's an area, a shape, a pie, or even a line chart on the fly. So this encompasses uh, uh, predefined reports, it encompasses ad hoc reports, visual analysis and dashboards, and with the robust APIs that are available, JReport is a full-featured embedded solution for, for your application. So with that in mind, I'm going to turn things back over to Dean. All right. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for that in-depth demo. Um, so let's see. Once I get uh, control, I will share my screen here. Okay. So hopefully that uh, demo gave you a good understanding of JRPort and what some of the, uh, the customization embedded features are uh, and also interaction features. Um, so, you know, JRPort does work across a lot of different data sources, relational databases, uh, Hadoop, of course, uh, uh, NoSQL databases like MongoDB. We've really built a pretty uh, rich uh, partner ecosystem where we've actually partnered and self-certified across a lot of these different uh, vendors. Um, you can go to our website for a full listing of uh, different uh, technologies that we support as data sources. Um, so just a real quick slide on our global, global customer base. We are not uh, focused specifically on um, any specific types of verticals. We are, you know, working across verticals in financials, telecom, uh, ISVs, healthcare. So uh, you can see a lot of big customers on there. A lot of large deployments, uh, specifically Visa and HBC, HSBC, are very large deployments that are actually using uh, JiraPort uh, cluster services. Um, and actually, there's several projects at Visa and at HSBC that are using uh, JiraPort. So I um, just want to talk about uh, some quick next steps. Uh, we're going to send out a follow-up email, and uh, this will give you a good look at JIRAPORT 13.1. You can actually uh, install it and uh, try it out for free, uh, a fully functional version of it. Um, we'd love to do a free proof of concept with you guys and uh, you know, understand more about your requirements. Uh, we'll send out a white paper uh, that talks about uh, embedded reporting and anal analytics. This is done by the research group uh, OVUM. It's an on-the-radar on the white paper. Um, you can go to our website and the homepage. You can download or you can actually watch a on-demand product demo. This is a YouTube video. And, of course, uh, email us for more information. Follow us on Twitter. And uh, we'll be here till the top of the hour to answer any other questions that you guys may have. So just go ahead and type them into the, uh, the question box. Um, so before I do that, I want to uh, actually uh, ask a couple of uh, polling questions uh, while I have you here. So 
Um, the first one is in, uh, you know, are you actively searching for a BI reporting solution? All right, great. So thanks for that. And uh, let me go back to the slide here. I um, have a couple of questions coming in that I'd like to have Mike uh, answer. Um, the first one is, let's see here, um, can we customize JReport to integrate with our existing single sign-on and security systems? Oh, the answer to that is yes, you can. And, and how we do that is we're embedding JReport on the back end. So that will utilize the JReport Java APIs in, in which you can integrate by implementing an interface. Because normally for single sign-on, uh, typically users will log into your web application, but users are also required to log into JReport server. And we don't expect this simultaneous logout. So that's a great example of single sign-on. So if your back end integrates with JReport via the JReport APIs. Now you can seamlessly have your users log into your web application and simultaneously it integrates within JReport as well. Great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, there's one more here that's um, how do you embed JReport into non-Java uh, non environments? That's another great question, Dean. So that's an example of embedding JReport on the front end. And regardless of whether your web application uses uh, JSP, Java, .NET, ASP files, PHP, Python, Ruby, ColdFusion, any web application, as long as the users are interfacing with your application via browser, then it's, pre it's transparent because all of those calls are done running a report via URL. So if you're scheduling a report, running a report, viewing the reports, everything can be done via the APIs or just running the reports via URL. They are both the same and it's totally integrated within JReport. Great, thanks Mike. Um, okay, so one last one here is, uh, uh, we have hundreds of queries written for JReport. Uh, do we need to write new queries or modify our queries to enable ad hoc reporting? Another great question, no, you won't have to modify in any way, shape, or form any of those queries. The next task at hand is your starting point in terms of workflow from the query, you'll now be creating that semantic layer, and within JReport, we call that a business view, and that's what allows your users to create their own ad hoc reports from scratch, because they're not seeing these cryptic column names, they're seeing all the data elements clearly laid out in front of them so they can build their own ad hoc reports from scratch. But nope, you don't have to create or modify any queries. Great. Thanks, Mike. Well, that's it for the webinar. Um, again, look out for our follow-up email. We'll send it out tomorrow. We're going to be posting the recording of this webinar online probably by tonight or tomorrow morning at the latest. Um, and, you know, reach out to us for any questions. We will be here um, until the top of the hour to answer any more questions. So just type those into the questions box and I uh, look forward to speaking with you. Thanks a lot, everyone.